in the chat and group on this webinar that's going to be on measuring the customer experience, getting beyond the net promoter score to generate actionable insights from the voice of your customer and ways that you can then use those insights to put together a plan that's going to help to create more highly satisfied and loyal long-term customers. I'm Denny Chapman, Jr. I'm a managing partner at the Chapman Group. Uh, we'll get to the good stuff that you're on the line for here shortly, but a couple of administrative things, just in case anybody's new or unsure. In the task bar on the right-hand side of your screen when you logged in, there's an area where you can ask questions or comments or things. Please feel free to use that all along the way throughout the webinar, and then when we have time towards the end, we will answer any and all of those questions. There will be a copy of the presentation that's going to go out to everyone, also a link and the ability to download the webinar to listen again or share with colleagues will all be made available for you when the time comes along. If at any point you want to learn more about measuring the customer experience or the Chapman Group, if you look in the lower right-hand corner of the title slide that I'm going to pop up on the screen now, you'll see the URL and the web address to get to www.chapmanhq.com where there are a bunch of free resources on measuring customer experience and survey, strategic account management, other types of customer metrics that can help your organization create more loyal, long-term, profitable, revenue-generating customers. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over control of the webinar and the slides to Dennis Chapman Sr., who has been doing this for more years than he will admit to you in person but who has a lot of expertise, knowledge, and good golden nuggets that he would like to share with you that will help you generate actionable insights from your customer experience measurement programs. Dennis? Denny, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the uh, kind words and the reference that I've got a lot of experience and we won't speak to the years, but I started at a very young age. I would like to uh, I always like to start out by saying that I really believe this is an extremely important topic in today's global business arena or national business arena. I mean, what could be more important than thinking about how I keep and grow my, my customers? That's a very important topic. Uh, sort of our goal today is to, is to make sure we give everybody on the phone and in the webinar the chance to uh, take away a, an appropriate nugget or two for themselves that they can use in their own uh, business environments, as well as you know how we can how they can turn uh, some very valuable voice of customer insights into actions, and uh, ultimately, as you said, create you know these more highly satisfied loyal customers because uh, that's what we're all after. Um, we are going to uh, reference the you know to the to the point around the NPS and that promoter score about there are so many companies that have adopted um, you know in the in, uh, that as a as a metric. So we will certainly speak to that about a probably go beyond that into this next generation of uh, creating more highly satisfied loyal customers. I always uh, like to say thank you for those attending. Have a good audience today, and uh, and kudos to you for always uh, taking the time to do some some uh, continuous learning and improvement. I think that's what it's all about. We see that in a lot of arenas. You know, they we always know in sports it's usually the most successful teams are those who constantly try to improve. Certainly in medicine, it's the, the innovation and creation improvement around medicines and, and healthcare and products. You know, a lot of companies are constantly looking at how they can improve their products and services. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, it's probably more of a business function. Within the company, how can we get better at connecting with, engaging with, and uh, really serving our customers? Um, so without further ado, let's let's discuss a little bit about what we're going to cover here today. We're going to talk about facts that about customers that we should all be aware of. If we're not, I'll share some that sort of keep at the top of my mind. Share certainly how important it is to listen to customers and ask the right questions. Talk about having a foundation uh, around customer supplier relationships and challenges, and how do we really elevate the our VOC program. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about the net promoter scores. I mentioned has been a successful metric for a lot of organizations. Give you a little feedback and background on that, and then suggestions and how to go beyond that. What's next and, and where to go? What are some of the whiffums if we follow these recommendations and um, and processes? 
and, and conclusions and summary points. As Dan, Danny mentioned, two things. Uh, we certainly will make the presentation available to everybody, uh, as well as at the end of this session, um, answer any questions that we may get. So some interesting facts. So let's get right into, you know, sort of the real core facts that we know. We know that um, about 70, uh, one study said that 70% of defecting customers said they were satisfied or highly satisfied in their previous satisfaction survey. Um, that's a frightening number to think that that many people said they were um, you know, satisfied with their previous uh, supplier, but they still left them. Um, is it possible that the survey was measuring the wrong, the wrong insights and facts of the customer? It's quite possible. We, we know something really important also, that fully engaged customers deliver a 23% premium. Uh, and that's real important because I think getting feedback from customers enable, enables us to be more fully engaged with customers and it does pay off in the long run. Um, wow, is it expensive to replace uh, a current customer? It could take five five dollars for every one dollar of lost revenue to replace, you know, a top customer. And so we want to really focus on how we keep and and grow those top accounts. And, and raising customer retention rates by just a few a few percentage points really increases the value of the customer. Probably twenty five to fifty percent of our customer portfolio. Uh, keep in mind. Every customer's expectations and needs vary, so we got to be very careful when we get into these kind of programs and processes that we're not making assumptions based on an entire market. While we can do some of that, uh, we have to be, you know, what we're really talking about today is how do we get very account specific because that's what's very critical. And the experts, you know, in the, in the marketing revolution said really that, uh, that current customers are really, again, probably worth five times more than new ones. And, and, one thing that, that, that's really keyed into me lately is that a lot of times companies really don't see the ultimate profit relationship there with a customer, sometimes to the second, third, fourth year of a relationship because of the acquisition costs and other things on the front end. So keeping customers longer terms are real important. And, and a customer focus, you know, and certainly surveys in 2002, senior marketing uh, management marketing executives said, that this is really understanding our customers is, is a priority 82% of the time. That's a high percentage. Uh, and 40% of senior marketing executives said that they didn't have enough insight. And I think that really in 2014, we, should, we really should be where 100% of the time it should be a key focus of an organization. And we, as a point today, we should have, you know, really high, close to 100% of the time, have some very good facts and insights about our customer. So what is this thing that I'm referencing about customer satisfaction and loyalty? So let's get a little bit of a foundation here. You know, optimizing a customer experience is really what we're about to drive, you know, mutual wins, certainly for the customer as well as you as a strategic supplier, uh, but also improving the retention and profitability within your customer base. So. We know that um, in, for conversation sakes today, what we're calling loyalty is really probably a higher degree of satisfaction, maybe something we may not be measuring today, and we'll get into that a little bit. What's driving the, the importance of this? Well, we've, we've obviously gone through quite a, bit, quite a bit of changes in the last few years in the, in the global business economy, but if we really look on the right side of our screen, we see that the customer world has really changed. I mean, there, very financially driven. There's a, there, there are options all across the globe for many customers. Um, they're really pre-qualification. They're much more informed buyers. They're looking for total solutions and they don't have as many resources they used to have to work with many suppliers. And we all know this. We, we live in this bullet world of impatience. Uh, you know, I need it now or probably before I even need it very quick. So though the customer world is really, if you look at the bottom arrow there, is creating, not that it's right, potentially a little lower level of loyalty towards strategic suppliers. So, and the supplier world is changing as well because there's some saturation, increased competition. Some of the relationships uh, aren't uh, as valuable, uh, not as valuable, but certainly as, uh, as relevant or as uh, valuable to each party or on the surface. The consultative selling approach is probably not where it used to be as far as an important process. And the growth from existing customers is not always there that they need to be there. 
So we got this thing going on here that the customer world has been rapidly changing. Uh, the supplier world, when you look at the top, is in some cases losing some traction in their customers. So what do we do? I think that's today's discussion is uh, how, can we, how can we get this thing back on track be between both parties? We know there's some challenges here. We know that, uh, that it's really important that the organization buys into this and supports a program. There should be some process and methodology that we use and have some dedicated resources to do it, and data is real important. But really what, what I think our focus is here today is the importance of transitioning this feedback, the data, into action. That's what it's all about, as you'll see here shortly, and integrating the voice of customer into our operations as an organization. So it should, this, this program, this process that we're referring to as voice of the customer should really be well recognized across all of our business functions, all the way from manufacturing to sales to customer service to executive leadership. There should be a, an integration and, and, a, and a value placed upon it and knowledge of what we're doing and, and how we're using that data. Because ultimately what we're really doing is using this data to improve customer relationships. And uh, that's really one of the big challenges is are we really improving customer relationships? So probably the first thing to tackle here is developing and elevating your current VOC program. We, we know that uh, many organizations are, are here, getting from here, and if I look at the bottom of my chart here, that they've built some program awareness, they've, they've got some buy-in, they're, they're really executing the voice of the customer surveys. As I mentioned earlier, probably the net promoter score is, is one of the core ways they're doing that. They're analyzing their data. But I think once we move beyond those first four data points, the real question is, how, how do we go from there you know, to here? And, and to here is, is really, how do we get to the important reports, a prescription for success in, in interpreting that data? Uh, how do we take this data and link it into action plans and implement those action plans? And how do we link voice of customer results um, uh, to our organization and how we're seeing a payback on that? And how are we developing these program level action plans that really integrate their feedback from our customers into all levels in our organization, management operations, sales, strategic account management, account management, whatever your preference is. So really the mission here is today is to give you some um, um, hopefully golden nuggets and ideas and concepts around how to get from here to there. And so that all these uh, um, actions that, that you see across the bottom of your screen uh, become reality for you. Uh, a little bit about the net promoter score. I mean, it's been around a while. It's probably more than 14 years out there for sure. Uh, it was, so everybody knows, built uh, originally as a customer, a B2C, customer satisfaction metric. Did a great job, served its purpose really well. Uh, many organizations have also uh, adopted it in the, in the B2B arena, even though it was initially designed for that. Um, and that has uh, presented a little bit of challenge for some. Others have uh, certainly appreciated some good rewards by at least having a, a metric from their customer to guide them um, on the stability of their uh, account portfolio. What we're offering up today is uh, there may be some things to do that can enable us to get beyond this, um, get beyond uh, the net promoter score and have actually more uh, value appreciated for, from the customer feedback. And for those who aren't familiar, the that promoter score does use a scale of 0 to 10. There are three types of classifications, advocates, passives, and detractors. Um, and there are really just a few questions. The, the primary one you know, that we all know is, uh, is basically, you know, would, you, would you recommend us? There are other versions that people have added some follow-up questions to that that we'll discuss shortly. I think the big issue that, 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 that lurks out there for all of us is uh, if you look in the left column, the net promoter score, these are some of the attributes of that and what it does. But the right column highlights from other resources and comments from other authorities on the subject that you know there are some challenges with just using a net promoter score relevant um, to the B2B marketplace. And, and I'll highlight one, the second, the second uh, line from the top on the right is that certainly in a business, uh, in B2B environment, we could be working with companies, organizations that have multiple influencers. And uh, we've got to get feedback from multiple influencers, and we would like to have very specific feedback from them across multiple 
um, um, disciplines or functions within their organization. And uh, for us, that is because all of them may have different uh, drivers and, and decision criteria. So right away, we can see that the complexity uh, is much greater in a B2B environment because in addition to that, we then properly should then use that feedback to go back and engage our customer, um, all those customers, or what they've said to us. So as you, when you do receive this, there are some critical data points here I need to consider because the, the measurements of feedback in a B2B environment is much different uh, in a B2B versus a B2C. Now, certainly as the NPS, as I mentioned, you know, uses this scale of 0 to 10. Um, and, and anybody that really comes in and checks off 9, 10, extremely like to recommend, is categorized as a, you know, as a, as a uh, uh, advocate, a promoter. Um, uh, uh, eight, sevens, and sixes are usually classified in more of what they call a passive arena, and the zero through fives are the so-called detractors. That's important, but what we would what we would argue is why would they be rating that relation? Why would they be saying whether they would or would not, and and, and to what degree they would recommend us? Uh, that's the operative question on the table because there's a lot of different facts that we would like to know that could influence why they're giving us a 5 or a 10 or an 8 or a 9. Because ultimately what we really want to do is we certainly want to keep those 9s and 10s. Ideally, we'd like to move the passes, the 6, 7, 8s, to, you know, to promoters. And certainly it would be great if we could take those 0 to 5s, learn enough about what their concerns or feedback is, and even move those to promoters. I mean, I guess the ideal scenario would be everybody said that they're extremely likely 9 or 10 to recommend us. The reality is it's it's hard to get such a rating, but I would say it's very hard to get it if we really don't know what to do about uh, or why they're rating us a particular number. So the rating itself provides uh, good insights, but really what we're after here to the next generation beyond the NPS is to figure out more of the why. You know, we do know there are, um, you know, there's a methodology that says three critical areas that in satisfaction we need to know about are certainly relationships or people, as you see in the upper left. They're certainly in the upper right, products and solutions, and the bottom left, organization. So in the construct of any survey or feedback, we want to make sure, as you'll see shortly, that we, that we sort of bracket some of our questions so we know, so we can do a little more of a rifle shot around, is it people, is it product solutions, is it organization? And then finally, is that degree of commitment level in the bottom right? Um, this is how we look at things, that, that if you want to really go beyond the NPS and get really specific uh, feedback, we would like to have questions that enables us to know more about the relationships with our people, questions around our products and solutions, as well as our organization. Um, ultimately, uh, not in a negative way, but a positive way, the greater dependency there is between us and our and our customer and how, how we're mutually trying to win and doing a good job in each of these is what we call, what we call performance metric or satisfaction metric. And this is the context of what we, it would be ideal if we knew that. We certainly advocate that there should be, uh, in the commitment side of this, the commitment indicator, we advocate there should be some question around likelihood to recommend. We promote the fact that there should be also a questions around importance of maintaining a relationship, as well as the commitment to continue to business with us. Now here's where all of this should lead us. Ultimately, we should be able to take and look at our data and say when we receive yes, yes, yes on the right side, what are the commonalities, the correlation to where we're the strongest on the left side, the, the satisfaction or performance indicators? Uh, and, and conversely, if we're receiving no's, is it possible that those same uh, correlation or performance indicators are not scoring as high? That enables me as an organization to take the appropriate actions to help in, in the NPS world it moved more people to, to what I'd say likely to recommend in our world to promote a higher degree of satisfaction or loyalty index. So because of the higher the loyalty index or the, the probably the higher propensity for revenue and profitability. Now we recommend when you, when you take a look at your voice of customer program, we recommend the 360 approach. And there are four critical elements to the 360. Certainly one is the organizational support and buy-in. There's the actual survey. There's using those results at action planning. And there's certainly the whole customer engagement piece. 
So let's take each one of those briefly and, and talk about orga executive organization support and buy-in. Probably it's up there as number one because it is critical because unless the organization and, and the management leadership of the company organization buy into this and support it, it's unlikely that it would happen. Um, our recommendation is the greatest way to, to gain that is to demonstrate, and here's just one example of, a, of, a, of an analysis, a study that we found, that the greater uh, loyalty within the customer base or portfolio, it has a tremendous impact on revenue. Look at the deltas here that uh, more sa highly satisfied loyal customers have a tendency to retain or repurchase 14% greater. 31% uh, greater wallet share, 43% better percentage of portfolio, portfolio penetration, and probably a 50% greater chance to adopt new products. That translates into economics. So, I mean, if I was uh, trying to campaign for getting my VOC program to get a little more wind behind its sales and strength and buy-in, I'd want to translate this into some kind of financial metrics. Uh, as an example, uh, what we've done is some modeling uh, which clients have found very valuable, and this is an example to say if you had a, this is a very, it's just for illustration purposes, but if you had a client portfolio that was about 200 in numbers, and the economics of the average value of each one of those accounts uh, in renewals and upsell and cross-sell and new products were, were those numbers of 500,000, 50,000, 100,000, and you currently have, you know, 20 uh, loyal customers that meet that criteria because of the index that you're getting from the survey. If you were able to move that needle and increase that number by 10%, 10% uh, of 180, which would give you another 18, look at the dramatic impact that it would have on your finances based on that previous study that we just looked at relevant to these kind of uh, revenue sources. It, this, this analysis says it by just upping 10% of my customer base to be more loyal, I could potentially see an incremental gain of $545,000. Now, not to get lost in that, but but if if I was going to invest $35 or $40,000, if that was a number, to improve my voice to customer program, you know, uh, that's almost a, a 50 fold return on that investment. And that's, uh, I'm sorry, I've got a 15 fold return on that investment. That's big. That's a huge return. Even if it was half of that, uh, two hundred fifty thousand, you know, I've got a six-fold return on a roughly forty thousand dollar investment. So one way to gain that senior level buy-in and support is to be able to track and demonstrate. And one way to do this is trending over time the financial implications of having a more loyal customer base. You can certainly segment your customer base by those who would score out as more highly satisfied and loyal versus those that weren't. The other is the whole survey execution uh, with results is to be able to, to look at your results, certainly to have a loyalty uh, index as well as, by the way, you see we, we've kept in the net promoter score. Many of our clients have kept in the net promoter score but have enhanced their survey process by adding the questions we spoke to. So they now, in addition to having a net promoter score, they also have a loyalty index uh, and they can sort and filter that data uh, certain ways to analyze that relevant to uh, specific survey response rates, so specific feedback from accounts and contacts. So uh, there's the best of both worlds going on here, both you know the continuation of the net promoter score as a, as a baseline, but also now adopting uh, maybe an additional uh, metric to, to move us to move the needle a little higher in what we expect from our customer base. Probably one of the last the two items here that are very critical is this whole thing about results in the action plans. And uh, well, if you look at this study, it says that the driving action based on VOC results, that this study basically said that, uh, that only 45% of surveyed participants said they had the adequate tools to collect and analyze data. They, they, only 45% said they're getting the right reports for internal groups. This is the number, however, that concerns me the most. It's that only 48% uh, in this study, and, and it's pretty recent, 2012, said that they had systematically, uh, that they were systematically driving the right actions from their voice to customer feedback. I would think that uh, a voice to customer program, when, when adopted and executed properly, our philosophy would be that 
of 100% of the time that it's helping to drive the right results. And uh, that would be, uh, that's exactly why I would do it. So the uh, survey to action process, uh, we suggest as a best practice, looks a little bit like this, which is do the survey you know, and analyze uh, the results. But then either internally, if, if you've got those right resources from either sales, customer service, management, is to analyze that data, but also then create some form of a prescription for success. What do I need to do based on these results, the voice of the customer? Now, uh, heads up, if you don't have that expertise, there are certainly organizations out there that uh, can create prescriptions for success to guide you in, uh, okay, interpreting that analysis and the feedback you get and translating that into, into action planning so that it relates to what a sales organization might need to do, what a product organization service might need to do, or even an account management organization, what they might need to do to optimize the relationships with these accounts. And finally, this whole customer engagement piece, I mean, the term we think of all the time is closing the loop. Unfortunately, many of us get these surveys, and sometimes we take them, sometimes we don't. Uh, there's such a difference, by the way, between a consumer survey and a B2B survey. Um, you're really looking at the behaviors and information coming from an individual consumer versus a, versus a, a group of influencers from a business. But here's what's very critical. Uh, quite often, consumer surveys, you never hear back from anybody again. In our world, in the B2B world, we suggest that the whole closing the loop, engaging the customer around the feedback and developing collaboratively action plans of how we're going to work together to make this happen is exactly uh, the difference. And then having some milestone checkpoints in how we're doing and then conducting follow-on surveys, as you see the far right, to enable us to continue this process, what we suggest maybe at least twice a year in some cases. Uh, a great illustration of how this works in strategic account management, quite often we see the voice of customer feedback integrated right into the account plan. It's a key source of information to guide the strategic account plan, you know, for with the account management team as they engage with some of their top customers. Now there's certainly two environments, which we like to call maybe the internal and the external environments, that provide us opportunities to use this feedback. You know, on the right side, you see internal opportunities like team meetings, account planning, coaching sessions, leadership reviews, compensation planning, internal business reviews around top accounts. These are all opportunities to take that feedback and speak to it. There are also these external opportunities. These are those situations where I'm engaging with my customer, whether it be collaborative action planning, external business reviews. By the way, a uh, there's a significant movement out there around joint and balanced scorecards between customers and strategic suppliers, executive roundtables, shareholder stakeholder reviews. So I've got these two uh, situations, internal and externally, that provide me opportunities to make provide this feedback have more value to both the customer as well as the strategic supplier. Uh, I think the question for all of us is to say, are, are we taking advantage of these opportunities? and doing what we need to do in those situations. So today we're talking about going beyond the NPS and measuring customer feedback to determine next actions. So some, some real tips, some tips here to, to, to guide you into getting into this next generation voice to customer program. Think process. Uh, by process, you, you know, are we measuring high, wide, and deep? Are, are, is, our, is our survey script tailored? Um, and is it is it able to be different to if an executive gets it versus an operational person? Can, it, can I make it work that way because there are some questions that are going to be relevant to some and not so relevant to others? That affects the value of the feedback. If we're asking um, questions to some people and they answer them and then they're not, they're not fully aware or relevant or knowledgeable about it, do I really have a process? And look at the last step of that process of, do I, am I really closing the loop and creating action planning around it? And uh, my touch frequency, am I getting a, a couple data points every year uh, from either the same contact or other contacts in an organization? We know that we want to get data points so we can trend trend the results. You know, because we want to, if we take action, the, the, the rubber hits the road, um, that we should see an improvement. 
ultimately when we get feedback and we take actions, we should see an improvement and ultimately see our customer satisfaction or loyalty index improve. And just as a refresh, when that improves, that should correlate to more uh, revenue and profitability for us. And are we committed to the process? Do we have that executive buy-in and interaction? We follow three simple guidelines. We measure, we analyze, and we act. We measure, we analyze, and we act. I think that's critical for us to, uh, to offer out there for you maybe to take back to your organization and say, is, is this reflective of how we approach our voice and customer program? By the way, just for a definition standpoint, high, wide, and deep, we're talking about making sure that the breadth of contacts and relationships that we measure are across business units, uh, that there are also multiple numbers of people. So I've got a, a pretty reliable, statistically reliable sample of feedback at even the individual account level. And that's critical to keep in mind that you know one data point from a large strategic account I would say is it would be risky business uh, to to base an entire action plan around that account based on one data point. A couple other best practices we've seen out there to ensure program sustainability is the integration of these metrics uh, around customer satisfaction and loyalty into uh, into KPIs, key performance indicators. In some organizations, they actually uh, affect bonuses and compensation. Another is to incorporate the loyalty metric as part of what I talked about earlier, some of the core processes of uh, internal account reviews, collaborative action planning with customers, executive business review. So really get it up there, get this metric out there up on the dashboard that's well recognized internally to my organization as well as to the customer organizations. So what are some of the big conclusions I'd like to have you leave with today? Um, I, I'd like to offer up that that what we're talking about here today of measuring a higher degree of satisfaction and loyalty is really not really an option. I, I think it's mandatory. In today's competitive changing world, um, many, many of us, our success is going to be highly driven and influenced about how well we understand our customer and how well we act to what their expectations and needs are. Secondly, uh, we want to make sure that we're getting feedback that's, that certainly it includes emotion, business, and structural dependencies. That whole area of people, product, solutions, organization. I want to make sure I get a wide breadth of uh, data points, uh, which we would have a tendency to call methodology that gives me that in my survey script. And finally, um, anything short of doing these best practices that, we, that we're talking about today or, or moving ourselves in that direction, I would say would be putting probably some critical account relationships at risk. And in today's, again, highly competitive uh, environment, probably not a wise thing to do. And there are wins here. So by being more actionable around the voice of customer feedback, you certainly uh, will have the right facts uh, to move customers from, from satisfied to more loyal and committed. It will hopefully, uh, hopefully help you uh, create more of a superior long-term financial plan. Uh, executives like that quite a bit, the retention and growth. Uh, it's a key performance metric to, to measure yourselves against. Are we really doing a good job? Uh, and by the way, it's a predictive analytic. The better your surveys are, uh, we would recommend that it could becomes a – who wouldn't want to know that a customer is what they're thinking about doing before they do it? Uh, and finally, uh, the, the big win for your organization is to integrate it into, the, into your structure and show how it's being used to help close the loop with customers so that you as a cross-functional team can take it there. And you know, when you really think of your accounts, you, you really become what they're looking for, a key strategic supplier. You improve your operational excellence. You can give them extraordinary customer service. Uh, they have open communications. I like, I like a couple words around you become much more valuable, economically valuable, and you become much more relevant because you know what they're thinking and you're taking action. So value. Economic value and relevancy is critical. And you can project the future by having the right services and, and products and solutions for the future. I think Jack Welch said it well in a very simple statement he, he gave out to the marketplace. He said that an organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. So basically he was for telling the future there a little bit by saying 
we really need to know our customer. We need that feed feedback, but it, we would like to say it's more than just getting the feedback and the voice of the customer. It's really putting it to work. That's the difference. The organizations that put it to work, get it into action, that's what makes the difference. That's what we've seen. So some quick summary points. It's important to keep in mind that we get the right measurements from the right questions, that we engage our accounts, that we close the loop, get these uh, action plans, collaborative action plans around the feedback so we can show improvement, and that we take action. I mean, the, the onus is on many of us, as well as sometimes the customer, to take action. That's where it is. So when we go back and think about a little bit the title here today of going beyond the NPS, I think we're going beyond it because we're getting richer feedback and data, and we're doing something about it. We're converting feedback, knowledge into action, ultimately into these great relationships that are mutually beneficial for both parties. So that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Denny because I know we've got a few questions here to address and uh, see if we can't do that. Denny? Thanks, Dennis. We, we have a couple questions that came in. The first one, uh, somebody would like it if you could go back over the customer engagement bubbles, so the uh, slides that speak to the internal and external ways to engage the customer in this process. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to highlight uh, the external, the, which are in the beige area now. Uh, basically, these are uh, opportunities or venues, think of them as situations, where we could go out and actually uh, bring the results in a variety of formats. For example, we have one client that puts it into a PowerPoint and demonstrates back to the customer uh, who is represented by their executive leadership team, uh, their operational team. And this is not just a, how do you like our products, how do you like our services, uh, how do you like the pricing? This is this is what you've said to us, uh, and let's talk about that and what we're going to do about that. And collaborative action planning that you see here is where we take their feedback that we've gotten and we work together to create this action plan that probably we're going to report back on after the next survey iteration. The external business review is very similar. It's more or less more of an update versus a collaborative action plan. And then the executive roundtables is where all of us are very familiar with where we send out our executives and do peer-to-peer -peer meetings with our client executives. This is also a great format to embed that feedback, uh, arm them, you know, sort of give them a summary of what the feedback has been and what we're doing about it, arm them so they can talk to the, their customer uh, executive levels about it. And, then, and that would also relate to the shareholder and stakeholder reviews, very similar. So these are situations where uh, that voice of customer feedback plays a key role, where in many cases we've noticed it's not used today. And there was one other question that came in. Somebody would like to know, in putting in a program like this, or trying to incorporate the initiatives that you've talked about, where could someone get their quickest wins in 2014? What would be priorities, you know, ways to make this happen and get a good return quickly? So, so here's what I would do. Um, and, and we're we're coming fresh off of our our uh, feedback program, which ended November December, and we've launched. We're getting ready to publish a sort of an executive letter. Where I think you get the quickest lift in two, in 2014 would be to right away go look at what your survey is is asking today, and is it rich enough to give you feedback that's actionable around what we talked about the people, product, services, and organization. Secondly, I'd want to go out and market to my other functions, the sales team, the account management team, customer service, and I'd want to make sure I include them uh, in a discussion, sort of a collaborative discussion around some of the richness of previous feedback and get them ready for another round of feedback. And third, I think the other would be to take that same team and, and engage them in this whole area around action planning make them part of the solution versus the process. So if I can get all that done in, the, in, in this Q1, or certainly no later than the first month of Q2, uh, those actions should translate into some economic uplift, uh, which we would see. One thing we've seen is the Opportunity Pipeline Funnel increases um, 
the more you engage the customer. So I would take those three immediate actions. Excellent. Well, that's all the questions we have. So we're going to finish up the webinar a little early. Let everyone get the last few hours of the day or, or you know, go back making clients happy and satisfying whatever needs or requirements they have or maybe closing down the day and getting out for some dinner or happy hour or something along those lines. A um, couple other administrative things before we go. Just let everyone know that I will be sending out a copy of the presentation as well as a recording of the webinar so that you can either share with colleagues, listen to it again, have the slides for your own benefit. On the slide that you see on the screen now, you have my email address written there, Denny Chapman at ChapmanHQ.com. Send any questions or comments you may have to me, and I will get back to you promptly and quickly. And the final piece, it's a little self-serving, but I figure I should let you all know, is that at ChapmanHQ.com, our website on the home page, there is a link that will give you the ability to register or sign up for what we call a VOC assessment where we'll walk you and your program through some best practices and questions and weight them and come up with some metrics, measurements, and recommendations on ways that you could make the VOC program you have at your organization better. So if you're curious about where you stand or how you measure up to other companies, I would take advantage of that offer free and then we've got some good expertise that we would love to share with you. So um, Dennis, thank you for the time and, and the presentation. Thank you. And I hope you all have a wonderful Thursday.